What is calling you on this day? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of, of what we are into today. You know, what kind of trouble are we getting ourselves into? And so I'm going to do a little of an overview of sacred storytelling. I'm seeing a lot of, of, um, of, of what is calling you on this regulars, day? is what I'll say. You know, people who come a lot, which I love. And so some of you, this and is going to be familiar, you know. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview oh, of gosh, what this we is, are into this is today. Not fun. Hold on. You know, what kind of trouble are we getting ourselves into? And so I'm going to do a little Whoa. of an overview of sacred storytelling. I'm seeing a lot of, of um, oh, sorry, guys. OK, there we go. We had a little bit of a situation where I, I put record on and it goes, it records to YouTube and um, it's, we started to hear it. So sorry about that. Can you still hear me? Is that working? Okay, great. Okay. So basically if you've been here with me before, a little bit of this is going to be very familiar. You know, I'm still going to do the basic introduction to, um, to uh, sacred storytelling. And if you are new to me, then this is great. And then what we're going to do today, which I don't normally do, is we're going to dig into our love story, our, our love stories. So we're going to be looking at story through the lens of, of that kind of um, conception. So uh, what you will do is begin by, uh, there's gonna be some times I'm gonna ask you questions and I really loved it when you answer those questions there. I'm not just like doing it to listen to myself speak or, or, or to be you know, anthetical. And, and, and when you actually bring your thoughts and ideas, you'd really deepen our conversation. So just adding that in there too. And so um, uh, a little bit about me. So I hail from uh, the East Coast I come from Vermont, Virginia, New York City. I always say I learned how to listen from a, from a creek in the back 40 of our, of our land in Vermont. And I continue to really learn how to listen, working as a wilderness guide um, for many, many years, working with youth at risk and all across the Western states and in Alaska. And it was really that listening that really brought me close to my relationship with the natural world. And at the same time, when I was very young, uh, I got really involved in storytelling. And, uh, but at that time, we called it reading books and writing and in theater and in plays. And I really began to um, not quite understand and know, but that there was a marriage between storytelling, my love of storytelling, and my love of wilderness. And I, and I kept feeling this love of connection to the environment and this love of story. And I, my love of story was taking me to New York City to study in the, in the world of professional acting. Um, I worked off Broadway for a little bit and summer stock, and eventually I ended up going to college, eventually got a master's degree in social work, really again, because I have this big love of the environment. And I really came to this kind of idea that you can't protect, you can't save the earth. You can't protect the earth if you can't save yourself. I'm saying all this because I think all of this is, it's, it's hard for me to take anything seriously about trying to save the earth because I don't think that's our job. But that's a whole other conversation for a whole other kind of storytelling. Um, so, but what I would say is, is that eventually I kind, I was able to come to this place where I got to understand the connection between the two. And I got to understand through study that, that this thing that I inherently naturally felt, this love of the earth, this love of story, this love of what happens when you bring people together in the space of story, that something magical happens. And that, that again, that inquiry of like, what happens in that space? Like, how do you use that energy that we co-create and like, use it for good. You know, I was really interested in that. So I worked in San Francisco and I worked with a bunch of filmmakers to make what social impact campaigns. I worked for Al Gore and I created the, the produced the Green Channel for the um, first television network. And I, and all the while kind of coming to this, this wondering, you know, what was I to do with this love of story and love of the planet? And the more I got to study myth and understand what stories really are, and the more I started to really understand the true origin of theater, you know, which was, you know, what is a myth? You know, we're going to talk about that. Um, but you know, it comes from the land. And and what is a what is theater? The very initial beginning one was a ritual uh, to celebrate Dionysus, and it is bringing the gods here onto earth and allowing them into the earth plane. So you see, all of this is is uh, the marriage of what eventually would come to really understanding story as a sacred art form and as a way of bringing back our relationship to ritual to ceremony as a, as a modality as a tool for healing and was one of those things that brings us closest to what is it to be human 
You know, and that's what I love about storytelling is that it gives us those super basic skills of what it is to be human. Because every good storyteller, if you really want to know what a good storyteller is, they began by listening. That's where it all begins, is in the listening. And if you really want to know who holds the power in the, in the, in the storytelling expression and an experience, it's the listeners. I want you to really think about that as we start thinking about all the different stories that are coming in from all across the world right now. So um, that's a little bit about my, my orientation and what brings me to you in this way. So let's, let's kind of come back into uh, the, some of the most ancient knowledge in the world, which is, you know, all the ancient religions agree that the world was sung, spoken, and chanted into existence. This is, this is kind of like a profound thing. I, and I don't want to skip over this. You know, that the, all the indigenous cultures understand humans, humans' unique role on this planet is that we sing it into existence. Our voice is what calls forth this co-creative reality that we have on this planet. And so when you start considering Oh my gosh, who are the people who have power? You know, we've got a real obsession in our country right now about who has got the power, right? You know, I really want to invite you into thinking about who's got the power. And we've got this battle of information, this battle of facts, this battle of narratives. Couldn't be more in our face, you know, about who holds the power. And I would say that storytellers play a very key role in this and that we're all storytellers. So I'm going to come back to this basic question, and it's a real question I'm going to ask you. And the question goes like this. What is a story? What is a story? And you can just raise your hand or take yourself off mute and answer. Gracie, did I see a hand go up? Well, I was actually waiting for someone else to talk first, but <laughs> I just had something simple. It's information. It's information, what you said? Yeah, story yes. information. Oh, great. The story holds information. Yes. Uh, yes. True, true, 40. <laughs> I know. I yeah, know the... I, 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 yes, I think of the story as a portal. Ooh. And depending on how that portal is built, it's the way you, you, once you pass through that portal, how you perceive things, how you perceive the world, how you see yourself within that. So that portal is really important. It's I, shape, it's color, everything. I love that expression. You know, I have never used that word, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play with this. So, you know, um, uh, Gracie spoke to, well, it holds information, right? You know, what do we know about the old storytellers? They would travel, you know, indigenous cultures, the, the storytellers would travel from village to village. They were the history keepers. They were the memory keepers. There are certain um, stories that were told once a year. Um, and uh, I wish I could remember which, which tribe it was in South America. And every year they would tell that story verbatim, word for word. And if the storyteller missed a word, out of place, he would have to stop and start over again. This was like a six hour story, okay? So, right, they, they, they are carrying forth our information. And there's something really powerful and potent to remember about these old storytellers is that um, they're the record keepers and there was a relationship to memory. In the oral stories, there's a relationship to memory that we no longer have. Something happens the moment we start to write down a story, the moment we record a story. You know, so right, and now now um, we're hearing this you know, this idea of like, oh wait, a story is a portal. We're like, whoa, I love that, right? Because you know, people, I just I just got to go into the VR last night into Burning Man's multiverse, and I was transported into this other reality that people had built, you know, and and I was totally there. That's great. But when we're a storyteller, you know, here we go. Once upon a time, in a land not so far away, in a time just the other day at the bottom of the ocean 
the bottom of the ocean, there's this great, big, beautiful, magnificent tree. She is so generous with her stature and with the amount of leaves that are shimmering in that water. And her leaves shimmer with a bit of gold. How many of you were able to see that image? Okay, so we just transported ourselves. We reality bend, we time traveled, we location traveled, we did all these things and we did it through this transmission process, right? And that's a, there's a whole, there's a whole class just on that. Um, you'll notice something, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna pinpoint this as a, as a technique for you just to kind of, um, cause I know that I've got a lot of, uh, I've got a lot of alum in the, in the room. So I'm just gonna give a little bit of an advanced class for you guys is that there can be, there's, I would say, um, there, there are many approaches to storytelling, but for the, for the purpose of this moment, I'm gonna say there's two approaches where some people have the technique of, I'm gonna go into extreme great detail and I'm gonna paint the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw the coloring book for you. I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna color it in for you. You know, and that's a style and technique of story. I'm gonna give you all the details. Okay, what I did was, a, was another kind, another style of storytelling, and it's more of a transmission where I actually see the tree inside of me. I actually feel it in my being, and it comes through this expression. I didn't tell you what kind of tree it was. I didn't tell you how, long, how, how many feet it was. I didn't tell you what kind of leaves were it, were it was. But some of you, it's all like creating an image, okay? So to me, I, I like this approach to storytelling for a couple of different reasons. And one of them is I feel like it's a little bit more generous to um, your listener and that gives them the capacity and the need to build their own imagination muscles. And I feel like this is a, this is a gift that we can give to people. You know, do we help people build their imagination or do we, do we help them be really lazy and, and, and do all the work for them? So this is, these are the kinds of choices that you get to make every day when you are beginning to talk story. You know, another example of this is, um, you know, I could tell you about the most beautiful woman who just walked in the door. I mean, she's something. I mean, when, when she walks in the door, all the heads just, I mean, the voices go quiet. The eyes wander. You know what I mean. If I had told you what that woman looked like, I would have had a form of colonizing your imagination and defining what beauty looks like. Right? We, where we are, a lot of us live in cultures where I've been, you know, part of that. But if I just give you the expression of what it feels like to me to be around that kind of beauty, what happens for you? What do you experience? What do you imagine? What comes alive in you? So, um, okay. You go, I'm going wildly off the idea of what I was going to say, but this is great. This is what happens when you keep coming. I'm just going to give you, I can't repeat my normal webinar for you guys. Now, this is the beauty of, of, of having alumni in the room is that I go, I go into different things. Okay. So I'm just looking through your notes just to see what I can that I can pick up from what is a story. You know, the, the other thing is that it's beliefs about where we come from, dreams and where we are going, Jen, yes. And so here's what I would say. What we understand is that, and as we approach ourselves as humans and, and what we do is that we will often um, uh, do this thing of uh, uh, referring to our bodies, referring to our, um, yeah, our bodies in relationship to the latest technology. So here we are in the era of computers. And so I'm going to refer to use that, that line of thought and say, okay, so a story is an operating system. This is a very unpoetic expression. And it's an operating system where we learn our beliefs, our values, and what we believe is possible. Okay, so now think about all the television programming that you grew up around. What was the programming that you received from your families? What are the stories that you learned about all of those other people? You know, what, what, did, what were you told to expect from life? What were you told that you're, what role you were supposed to play? You know, so, and we got this through our families, through our television, through our fairy tales, you know? So gosh, now we're, now we're getting into it. Like, oh, now let's think about, oh, well, what were the love stories? 
you know, how many of us, I'm going to, how many of us really did get the Walt Disney expectation or fairy tale version of what we were to expect from love? I, I totally got it, you know? Um, and so it's like, how, what does it take to break out of that story? Well, then you might go even go so far back as to say, well, wait, what was that story here to serve? Who wrote that story and why? Okay, so now we're starting to kind of come to this idea that stories have a life in them. So now let's go into that other question of what is a sacred story? What is a sacred story? Holding out for you. Chelsea, you are muted. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, so uh, like my intuition just automatically said like a universal heart story, something that connects without giving a proper name to it or too much detail. Yeah, something that resonates with all. Mm, okay, so you're talking about a resonance, like that there's this kind of, I used to call that like the inner nod, you know, when someone reads something or you hear something in a story and something in your body is like, yes, I feel that too in me, right? So there, there's something, there's a there's an, a universal knowing. John Steinbeck used to say, the storyteller must be about the reader or it will not last, you know, meaning that even you can tell the most, you know, in the form of a sacred story, you know, it's like, like in a story that's here, that's to serve, then, then it's, even I can tell you my story about cancer, but that story is not about me. When I come to the place of being and standing at the threshold of a sacred story, as a storyteller, I can tell you a story that has encapsulated something in my life experience, but it's no longer just about me, it's about us. You know? And that's what, that to me is the distinction between what is a sacred story, that it, there's something in its inherent value where it's a gift. It's about us. There's something in it that it's doing that is connecting us. Um, Laura is saying that a story that details the transformation and alchemy that occurs from a life experience, right? And so just look at that. She just she just kind of made a little arc for us, right? She said she said it's not just about this this one thing that happened that kind of sucked. You know, here I had this really traumatic experience, and I'm going to tell you about that. Okay, but she's making a distinction between a sacred story speaks to maybe something that happened and then there's a uh, transformation so we change our role we're, we're, we're not we're no longer in the same role that we were when before that happened we've been changed by it we've literally changed form and now she goes so far say, and then there's alchemy right and so we're now we're we're taking the gifts we're taking the medicine all those things that happened and we're integrating them and now all of a sudden we have a gift to give so perhaps you had a really traumatic experience but you weren't that person that it happened to. And sometimes in the course of telling it, then, then there's a healing that happens for you. There's a gift that happens for others. And that's kind of happens in that arc. And again, it becomes not just about me, my experience, be, witness me, tell me, you know, there's a, there's a place for that. I really want to honor that in something at the beginning. There's a moment when you come together and you do need to ask to be witnessed. It does need to be heard just as it was. And then there's that moment when you might decide to make it into a gift to give to others, where you start to share your wisdom. And that to me is the distinction between now it starts to come into that place of becoming a sacred story. Um, anyone else wanna take one last gander? What is a sacred story? To me, I also understand that a sacred story, it has a life force in it. It has, we're using that word sacred, right? So it has, well, let's say it's it, it, the divine, like I honor the life force that lives in it, you know? So the, there's a setup as soon as I call something sacred, because as soon as we do that, through the inherent use of the language, we inherently said that something else isn't sacred. Why make, what makes that mountain a sacred mountain and the one right next to it not a sacred mountain, right? Like what? That doesn't make sense, you know? And yet we need to call on this language because what does that language bring us to? It says, I see the life force. Not only do I see the, the life force, I honor and have reverence for the life force and respect for the life force in you, okay? So that's when we're, a lot of times when we're invoking that through that, through that language of sacred, that's what we're, we're, we're calling back this practice, remembering this way of what it is to be land-based people who understand that all, all things have life, 
Okay. So now we're saying, oh, look, you know, a sacred story. Oh, wait, you mean, you mean there's a life inside of a story, you know, and that it has a life force all of its own. And then it has, perhaps it's even its own, it's in service of something. And maybe it even has its own will. What is it to come into relationship and reverence and respect for a sacred story where you can come and approach in such a way where you are so humble as to allow it to reveal itself to you rather than express or impose your ego on it with your um, decided imposition of the point that you're going to make and you're going to enslave that story to do so. I would say that we are living in a time when um, once upon a time documentaries were true, true witnessing of how life was going. And that form, we deserve, we, we, we deserve a different name. And I love what's happened in terms of making films with a real desire to make, um, to send a specific message. But let us not confuse that with uh, what a sacred story is, the distinction between allowing a story to reveal itself to you and using a story to manipulate and um, to uh, make your own point. So, and I'm not bashing documentary filmmakers, just so you know, I, I praise and hail and love that form. So, um, okay, so if we also look at, so you're, you're like, okay, so that's nice, like a, we've got a, a sacred story that sounds, you know, kind of sweet and precious. What's on the opposite side of a sacred story? And I would say that's a zombie story. So a zombie story is a story that is not here in service of life. So a sacred story, the, the last distinction I would say, it's, it is a story that is in service of life thriving, you know, so it's like life like supports life thriving. A zombie story would not be that. So now start thinking, you can think in two ways. Think about all the television shows and the latest movie that you watched. And when you walked away from it, did you feel enlivened? Did you feel inspired? Did you feel like you're ready to go kick ass and take some numbers? Or did you feel like you wish that all humans left the planet or, or completely depressed and frightened about the state of the world or the future? You know, so it's like, I, I'm really asking you to put on your spidey eyes, you know, now every time you see a story and just start thinking, hmm, what, what are you doing? Is this a story that's on the take or is this on the story on the give? And so now we can, can take it one step further and say, okay, great example of a zombie story is, um, is, um, Jaws. This was uh, written by Peter Benchley. I don't know why he wrote it. I don't know what inspired him. I do know who produced it, you know, which was Steven Spielberg. It was the very first movie he ever made. When we go back to really understanding a story, we want to understand who was the person that made it, what were the times that they were living in, what were they in service to, what was the role of the story in this time. We want to understand also that at that time, we'd not seen a lot of violent films. You know, it was still very, very new. You know, this idea of, of being able to see violence on, on, in movies. And um, uh, we know that Steven Spielberg's intention was to become a recognized, you know, director. You know, it was the very first thing that he did. What do we know but that that movie took place out on the open ocean, the very first movie to ever be filmed out in the open ocean. What do we understand about the language of symbols, whether or not you consciously speak the oldest language of humans, which is symbols. Um, uh, you, you speak it. <laughs> and so what is the ocean but our consciousness? So now we take this, this movie, we place it out in the ocean, which will, you know, here we are still, let us say a little naive in how we are re receiving television and movies and stories. There's no, there's no numbing out yet. It's all still so new. Think about when that movie came out. And um, the shark, the big metal shark breaks. And so the producers are brilliant and they're, they're, they're working on the fly and they just decide to show little parts of it. So now the viewer is no longer seeing some fake metal shark, right? Um, that they can disassociate from. Now they're just seeing symbols of it. Okay, now the shark, now we're, now we're, we're back into that and the shark becomes um, the symbol of the fear of death. Oldest story on the planet is about the fear of death and the fear of the unknown. That movie single-handedly became responsible for a great acceptance and great fear of an animal that is not that dangerous. I think they say more coconuts kill people each year than sharks and uh, a massive kill off. And when Peter Benchley, the creator of that story realized the consequences of the story that he'd brought forward, he spent the rest of his life protecting the ocean and doing his best to undo that damage. So I say this as a cautionary tale, because I don't think that there's a bunch of people out there consciously making zombie stories. 
But I think that this is a time when we have an opportunity to come alive into what does it mean to be a conscious creator in these times of great change. So I wanna give you an opportunity um, uh, to Jen saying there's the real story, Peter's story. I wanna, I wanna know more about that. Um, I wanna give you an opportunity to play with creating your own story, your own love story. So do you guys wanna play with that today? Mm -hmm. do, you, do I have a little game with that or do you wanna keep, I can continue with my normal class or we can go into an exercise of you getting to write your own stories. Who, who, wants, who wants to continue getting, hearing me talk about story? And who wants to create their own story? Let's see a little bit more hands on their own story. Great, two hands up wins. Okay, so I wanna give you an opportunity to really consider um, your love story. And this is gonna be a, a, a fun game that we're gonna play and we're gonna start engaging with your mythic imagination. So what is our mythic imagination? So Michael Mead says that behind this dimension is the mythic dimension. So here we're, we're just by engaging this very thought, you know, we're, 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 we're going to um, play at a certain perspective on the world. You know, the Hopis say that there's seven different earths. You know, there's a lot of different perspectives that there's many different dimensions, many different realities happening at once. And there are pieces of us living in all those dimensions. Okay, so this is a worldview. This may be your worldview, this might not be your worldview, but I'm going to play that this is my worldview and this is the game that we're playing in. So what if, what if there was this mythic dimension just behind the curtain that you can sense, that you are informed by, that you can feel that a part of you exists in, in that symbolic place? And that part of your love story is, is living out in that place. Okay. So what if, you know, you might want to, this is, this is one of my fun, my, a great way is if you have a love story that is challenging, if you've had a relationship that was really challenging, that was not quite formed, um, or not quite, formed, not, not quite, excuse me, a little unresolved, or maybe there's a love story that you still have some little pain over. Um, this is a great, this is a great thing to, a great piece to work with. Okay, so I invite you just to kind of presence and and just become aware of of that. Okay, so we're gonna take that and we're gonna put it up in the, in the right corner and just be like, okay, I know which situation I'm gonna use. Maybe it's between you and your cat. It doesn't have to be with a lover, but you know, it's like it's 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 something that has that energy of love. Now I'm gonna just invite you in the left corner of your imagination to be like, huh, what is the overlay of love story in my world? What are some of the, when we talk about this operational, you know, if it's an operating system, you know, what, what is in your programming around love? You know, is there a part of you, we have, I think we have all women with us today. And so we can play with those archetypal energies, you know, or do you have a sleeping beauty archetype? You know, um, there's so many of, of, of us that got the someday my prince will come, Cinderella, you know, um, there is a, there's this piece where there needs to be the masculine to, to bring us into the full power of who we are, sleeping beauty, you know. Um, there's so many of these different overlays. So why don't we just start speaking to them as they come to us and why don't we speak them out loud because as each of us speaks them, we're going to inspire each other to be like, oh, yeah, that story lives in me. And we're just going to, as we do it, it's, it's, a, it's a gift because you do a little spell. You know, it's, we're breaking spells when we start to name them because we, then we can start to see them. Once we can see them and name them, then we can have a conscious route to how we relate to them. Anyone feeling bold and naming yes uh, the little the little mermaid who trades her voice oh. for love. yeah okay thank you so what i was thinking about is i i watched mulan last week and again 
And I was thinking about like the, um, I guess the archetype who it's like a hero's journey, right? So um, you have a character and she's doing what she's not supposed to. Um, but then, you know, it turns out that she's actually following her heart's journey um, and she's becoming kind of her own warrior of her heart. And then that changes everyone around her just by following her own mm. heart space. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Anyone else feel? Yes, Joe. I'm going to whisper because it's 3.50 in the morning in Australia. So oh. <laughs> I, that's why I'm in the dark. I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah. it's, as we were talking, I just um, became quite aware of the, and as I wrote down before, the belief that everyone else is happy. And I don't know what story this is connected to from a, um, from a, culture popular culture perspective but that everyone else is happy and very much a victim mentality which surprised me but I just thought I'd share that one because it was it's, it's, it's not really connected to a popular story but yeah everyone else is happy but not me on my journey thank you for that and I'm always in awe of our Australian story champions who wake up so early to be with us so thank you thank you um Gosh, isn't that the story of our time? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you know, it's like here we are in this time of, of being able to put out these projections, you know, and it's like it's a story that we're also reinforcing every time we we play that game, you know. Um, yeah, thank you for saying that. One last one. Oh, two last ones. Yes. Kim? I have one. Oh, sorry. Great. Gracie? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so my story today is about loving my distracted self. Mm. And I think I'm putting down the story that some traits are lovable. And, and others are and wanting to hear from the mythic about how that kind of duality really blocks authenticity and the life force. Mm. You broke up a little bit, so I didn't get to hear everything. But what I heard you say was that this, I heard you speak about duality and that some traits are lovable. And I'm assuming, because that's when your voice started, that some aren't. Am I, am I catching the drift of what you were speaking to? Yeah, I've been in the story that some traits are lovable and some aren't. And that, that duality, I've been noticing how that kind of duality blocks me from being authentic, even inside of myself. Great. Um, I, well, the thing I love about storytelling is that it gives us access to wholeness in terms of um, that we can tell the whole big story and that everything can live in it at once, right? So those traits that are so lovable, you know, it's like what I love about storytelling is that you can actually flip them up and be like, well, what's the shadow of those lovables? things, you know, and you can look at the traits that are not so lovable, you know, let's, let's just play with some, some rage, some guilt, some, uh, you know, whatever, and then you can go to them in the form of story, and you can be like, oh, what is your gift to me? Rage, not a very lovable trait, you know, but what, 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 what do you, what do you stand for? You know, uh, and like you get to know them, and you get to love those parts of them, and you also get to look at the shadow of the parts that are everybody loves. What I love about this approach to storytelling and what we get in storytellers when we approach and see the world as being whole, all of a sudden we get to escape some of the confines of the hero's journey. The hero's journey, I can't get too much into this, it's a whole other class, but it's, um, it is a, a story structure that I would say might be squashing and strangling the Western world. Uh, in Eastern cultures, they understand the hero's archetype. It's a dangerous archetype. You don't really want a hero in the room. They're narcissists. They're dangerous. 
You know, we in this culture are like, oh, the hero, and we celebrate them, we put them up on pedestals, and no wonder we un you can understand that so many people are literally, I think, I, I don't know the stats, but, you know, when they say that leaders of a lot of the big corporations are, are like pathological sociologists, or uh, uh, psychopaths, you know, like, you know, like when you actually look at the uh, the DSM-4, so it's like, but, but, of course, we live in a society that idolizes that archetypal energy. So what is it to say? But when we look at the wholeness of things and we say, OK, how can we accept the, the, the good and the bad, the light and the dark? You know, that, that's such an explain like, well, here we are in this weird times, right? When we say, oh, we're living in dark times as if this is a negative thing. And then what does that say to um, the people who have dark skin? That these are a slight word, but it lives all through our entire a fabric of our association. When we look at oh, what is darkness? Ah, darkness is the mystery. It's the unknown. You know. So now, how do we look at our? How do we say things and uh, about well, what are we really saying in this? Oh, wow, we're living in big mystery times. We're living in times of unknown. You know. Again, the slight pivot of language creates a bigger story. And so I'm going to invite you over and over and over again to become. Uh, to to take luxury and to go slowly with your language as you understand each and every word is carving a path into a reality that you are letting someone else speak to as who was it said into the portal that will transport you into this other reality i like to think of story as a temple you know so what are you, what temple are you building for people to come into okay so I'm just going to give you a couple a recipe for creating a love story and then you, I'm going to and let you go create it on your own because our we're coming to the end of our time together. Um, so what I like to do in these moments is that if you take a really so we, what, what I wanted to do is just let you have that information of these overlays of stories right so we can say okay I can name you I can see you I can release you okay we're, we're breaking that spell and now we're coming into we're, we're going into the mythic dimension where we can see things with a different lens with a different perspective we're looking at the wholeness we're looking at the symbolic um, energy of things so um, if we were in a big class I would lead you on this big meditation where you would you know ground and source and do all those things and this moment we're going to skip all the theater and i'm going to show you right now that in the click of an eye or a snap of a finger click of an eye who's ever, who's ever thinking of that but um and, and the snap of a finger you can actually tap into your intuition okay so you have your story this this love story that we spoke to you know that you know the situation and let's just keep it simple it's between you and one other being Again, it could be a dog, it could be a parent, it could be an, an ex-lover, it could be someone that you're in a relationship with right now. When I snap my finger, you got that person in your mind, right? So you've got them in your mind. Now, how do they show up in the mythic dimension? What is their symbolic expression? Are most of you getting, did most of you see something? Yes, I'm getting Wendy, yes. It could be a crow, it could be a tree, it could be the biggest thing. This is the hardest thing to do in this is to trust yourself. That's where I see people start to kind of get all like messed up. They're like, oh, I don't know. It's it's a it's a worm. I don't want to be a worm. You know, and it will just but you have no idea the medicine and the exceptional capacity that we're like we couldn't live without worms. You know, so it's like I see people do a couple of things. They don't like what they see and they back paddle because they really wanted to be, you know, the, the whatever. Um, or they <laughs> don't trust what they saw. So just just trust what you see. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you the big question. What are you in the mythic dimension? How do you show up? First thing that comes to mind, trust that we are in a field where this can happen. Everybody got it? So now we're going to say, what landscape does your relationship take place on? Okay, so we're talking ocean, maybe it's the forest, maybe it's the kitchen. Okay, you ready? What landscape does your story take place on? You got something? You're probably looking at a list of things. You know, it could be worm, sunflower, and ocean. 
and you're like, I got nothing here. This is the weirdest thing ever. This is this makes no sense. Okay, and so what you would do now is you would you would um, respect that you have called towards you a sacred story, a story that is going to inform and reveal itself to you. You are actually in this luxurious place of having the day off. You got a break from the story. You know, that story that you've said over and over and over again, it's this is not that story, you know, so you get the day off. You don't have to tell it again. You're not forcing that story into the mythic dimension. You're allowing the mythic dimension to reveal itself to you and expose how it has been impacting the story that you're experiencing in this in this reality. Okay, so um, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite examples of, of someone who did this was um, a woman who was in a real situation with her brother, you know, and they just could not come into alignment and, and there was no peace in that relationship. And, um, and she didn't respect the way that he was living his life. And when she did this, he came up as a black crow, you know, as this essence of magic. And in their story, he revealed who, who he was and how he was living. And when she came out of that story, she had a new way of experiencing and understanding him in the world and how he made sense in that dimension. And, 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 and something to her helped her understand how and why he showed up in this dimension as he did. And it allowed her to open up to him in a different way. So I don't know what's going to happen to you for your story might be something very different, definitely will be something very different. But I tell that to you in the sense that um, I won't get to be here for the full unfolding of your story. I just wanted to give you a couple of tools to say, okay, now your job is to write your way into this humble place of deep listening with that story and allow it to reveal itself to you. No story is complete until it's told. So I invite you to, you don't have to spend Hours. Some, some of you, I did this, and I, I have found that sometimes these, these can be love medicine stories. One time I sat down to do this, and I, and I and 50 pages later, I had, I had a novella. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, that was that story. I've written these three, three pages later. But what I encourage you to do is once you write it, don't be beholden to the language, the words that you wrote down, because you're kind of in this listening mode, right? You're just, you're just calling for it. Don't have to feel like you've got to correct it as you go or get it all right. You're just listening and receiving the story, allowing it to you, yourself to go on the ride. So you might want to start it with once upon a time, there was a worm and allow that, you know, and you know the, the environment that it lives in, it's in the ocean. And now it's going to show you how it relates to that sunflower, you know, where whatever your images are. Um, and have fun. That's what I would say. Allow yourself to have fun with it. Does everyone understand kind of how the story recipe for this love medicine works? Yes, Gracie. Well, I have a question. I didn't hear what the first the first question was that you was that you asked that got you to the worm because the audio was corrupted. Okay. So the first question I, I invited you to um, choose just one other person that you were going to work out your your love story your love medicine story with, and so that one other person was the first prompt. Thank you. I see another hand go up. Great. Okay. So this, as you may or may not know, this was just a sampled class. You just got a little sense, a little feeling of, of what's happening here. And what's going to happen now is that if you feel complete, I'm going to, I'm going to read a quote. And for those of you who just came for the class, I'm going to say thank you very much for coming. It was a pleasure being with you. And then for those of you who are curious about what is coming down the pike, I do have a whole class that is completely focused on working with your mythic imagination and developing your personal mythos. And I will tell those who want to hear about it about that. And then I also have um, uh, a couple other things that I will, I will tell you about. So, but first let us end with a quote. And why do we end with a quote? Well, you know, it's like, it's like, um, you know, it's, it's like, uh, when I bow to my Tai Chi teacher at the end of a class, you know, I'm not just bowing to him, I'm bowing to him and his teacher and his teacher's teacher and his teacher's teacher. And it's about like acknowledging your place in the lineage. And so we begin, and usually I begin with quotes, but I didn't today. Um, but we end with quotes as a way of acknowledging all of those who have come before us. And so I, I give you this quote from a man who has been um, quite an influence on my life. 
and his name is Stephen Jenkinson. And here it is. Act as if you are people of consequence so that I can treat you as such and that you matter. What must have happened to people who unconsciously agreed that the best presence in this world is to have no consequence in this world? It's a velvet gauntlet, this idea of being of consequence. It doesn't clink when it hits the ground, but you can feel it. It would be proper to proceed that there is consequence to us being here. So Stephen Jenkinson, so I leave you with that quote and I leave you with um, a love of story. May the stories carry you well. May you, may you have your spidey glasses and, and see them and name them and work with them as you uh, meet them and create them. And um, now for those of you who want to know all about uh, what is coming next? If you feel called to play, we can keep playing together. Um, this class that's coming up is called Mythos, and it is a four-week online class. We begin in four days, and this is really about celebrating uh, our relationship with um, the mythic imagination and myths in particular. So what is a myth? A myth, when you, when you go back to the origin of it, um, it's a story that has no author. So we talk about these sacred stories. It's a wild story that has a life of its own and it's never been enslaved by words. So that's, a, that's the original uh, definition of what is a myth. So now what is it to come into relationship with your mythos? You know, so we took a little sample of what was it to meet yourself in the mythic dimension. We're going to spend four whole weeks doing just that and really understanding not, as, not how to tell our literal narrative stories, but how do we actually tell the biggest story, the story of our soul, the story of our multidimensionality and our multidimensional you know, um, expression. So in these kinds of stories, uh, storytelling, you get to play with, oh, what was that soul contract that you made? You know, what were your agreements that you came to be and, and what you came to give? Um, and uh, I'm seeing a little private note here. I don't want to hear until, okay. Um, Milana is saying, and she's, she's, she's saying, yes, I gave an assignment. So if you're, if you're beginning to feel like, oh, I think I want this, I want this class. I did give a first assignment, which was to get a book called The Myth Tellers, which is an amazing book by Sean Kane. Um, it will, we're not using it, you know, per se. So it's okay, Milana, that you don't get it in, in advance of the class. We're not getting, it's not like a book that we're studying, you know, uh, literally as we take the class. It was something that I really wanted to give those who are ste stepping towards their real own personal relationship with myth to really deepen their understanding of the origins of these stories so that it would inform, um, it would inform you of the lineage that you're participating in because a myth again it's not just made by the human it's not just made by the ego it's made in, in collaboration specifically with the earth so you will be doing some communing with your natural world with the land that you live on understanding that your story is part of of, of that story of the land that you're with and so that is um, the book is called wisdom of the myth tellers wisdom of the myth tellers by sean kane and um, if you go on there, you're going to see that it's out of print and you're going to get some offer to buy it for like $300. If you, uh, if you are clever and just start looking for used books, um, either on that, on that platform that I will not name, or there's some other great other platforms called like Better, Better World Books and other platforms that sell used books, you can definitely find one for like $13. Um, oh my gosh, I didn't know that you can buy it direct from the publisher in Canada. Huh says Julie, thank you very much. <laughs> um, the name of the book is Wisdom of the Myth Tellers. Here, I will type it in here. Of the Myth Tellers. And Sean Kane is the author. I begged and pleaded Sean to um, be our guest speaker uh, for this class. And he has been very kind in informing. Um, uh, he's been really, he's been very generous of spirit, but he's not someone that's going to hop on Zoom and do a class. He's kind of a, of another time and another generation. And so, uh, but but he's he's behind the scenes for us. Um, and I'll and I'll put in the link here just so that you have it because that is helpful. 
Uh, let's see here. Okay, so other things that are happening, they're coming down the pike, um, is that I do have this beautiful school for sacred storytelling. And it's something that I've committed myself to over these past couple of years. And, um, oh, Julie, thank you. Julie has given us a direct link to get this. And I will give it to everybody. Da -da -da. Um, really helps to have a, a, a publishing uh, expert in the house. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, the other things that we have coming, so I just, I just put in the link for Mythos, which you can see. And the thing that you'll also notice on there is that this is also connected to a School of Sacred Storytelling. So I have a nine month program and that program is actually based on the principles of the natural world and it's designed to ebb and flow. We actually, the entire thing is based on working with the seasons. So we had our very first class um, last month and it was called Sanctuary. And it was all about discovering your creator matrix. Who are you as a conscious creator? What is your operating system? We approach that as the kind of the prelude, the introduction to the, to the great novel of, uh, of, of experience that we're gonna have over this next year. So you can really understand what drives, what are the gifts that you came to give? What are the stories that are coming through you? What are the barriers that are in your way as a creator? So, and it's really designed to literally clean house because that entire class, amazingly enough, is actually based on creating a sanctuary in your personal home. So again, sacred story, you know, who, who, who are you? How do you become the tender of a sacred temple space? And what kind of, and, and what kind of um, space do you create in your body and your beingness as one who delivers those kinds of stories along with your personal space? So, um, uh, this, this, if you look at my old videos, you'll see that this room used to be a different color. And in the experience of, of teaching these classes, I, I've done, I, I've, I've done the actual workbook and, and done the whole process and procedure of getting to transform a, a physical space. And what I'll say is, is that, you know, I've been, you know, a, a professional writer, producer for over 20 years now. And I would say that the thing that kind of blew my mind while doing this process, and this really did come alive during the time of COVID, was that um, I was able to see in the course of 48 hours, some of my biggest barriers and blocks. And I almost like wanted to weep because I was like, really, that's all it took was to, for me to have like this physical manifestation of ex getting to experience myself as a creator where I could quickly grab and understand where my blocks were so that I could start to really face them and begin to meet them and begin to jump over them or around or dive underneath, you know? So I really, um, if you are someone who really is committed to that process of being a creator, whether it's as a writer or as a storyteller or as an architect or just a conscious creator in your life, I will say that Sanctuary has been um, one of the most fun classes that I think I've ever taught in terms of it's so out of the box and you're kind of like, wait, I'm in a storytelling class. I'm in a, in a different kind of class. Um, so I'll just give you the link because what we're going to do is I'm actually going to repeat this class um, at the end of September. So if you're feeling the call towards mythos, there is an opportunity to sign up for that introductory class of Sanctuary at the same time and you get a reduced price because why not? Um, and then for those who who were part of the, the original Sanctuary and mythos and want to continue, the, the, the following program continues. And so the next Sanctuary we're dealing with um, power and purpose. And so again, the sanctuary uh, segments are six weeks long and we'll have three of them over the course of the year and each one has a different topic. So uh, those are designed to go inward and to really understand what makes you, what creates your stories, what are the stories that have been driving you. And then you come out so that you understand that piece so that you can tell the story. And so after those six weeks um, sanctuary segments, there are four week skill building story segments. So there's a teaching story, wisdom story, um, you can see it. It's all, it's all there. There's links to it on my website. So if you're intrigued and you're like, wow, I want to be part of the whole school program, um, the early bird rate for the whole year is uh, ends tomorrow on the 5th. So if you're feeling the call, um, there's payment plans, there's all different kinds of things. But if you know that you're really looking for 
something that's going to a container that's going to hold you through these strange times and really support your creativity, your innovation, your fun, your play, your deep discovery. And to me, what I love about this is the capacity to alchemize what we're discovering and to really transform it into um, into medicine, both for ourselves and for others. So that's really a, one of the main intentions behind this year long program. Um, and then for those of you who are advanced students of story, I have an advanced program called the Artemis Circle. And this program is designed for people who know that they want to be standing in, in a place of being facilitators or teachers or leaders in their communities, and specifically working with story as a tool for healing, either for the individual or for the collective. And so you might be hearing this and you're like, I'm not a teacher or facilitator right now, but I want to be. That's literally what this program is designed for. And so that program is, is much more intensive. And there's, it's a smaller program. There's only 13 of us. And um, thank you, Lisa. And um, and what we do in that group is we meet once a month. You'll have an opportunity to, for an all-day class, and then we meet one evening each month as well. And in that time, you'll actually really get to develop your facilitation skills, your group process skills, how do you manage groups. But obviously, you'll also work on your own a personal story, and you'll have a, a performance where you get to bring your forth call forth your own and share your own story. Um, we're going to do a story ceremony for the collective. And so uh, the easiest way to explain it is what we did last year. We did the story of Medea. We, we studied that story and we ended up in a doing, this was pre-COVID, um, but we ended up doing an event in Berkeley with over 200 people that came to it. And while we told that story, we told it in context to the times that it was told in and our times. Um, and we ended up doing a massive healing and forgiveness ritual with over 200 people. And so again, how do we, how do we work and collaborate with story to um, bring us back to those old practices of being into ritual and healing as uh, their original form? Um, so you'll get to do that. We'll be doing it over Zoom. It's going to be a new wild adventure. How do we do this? And we're going to discover it. And then you also get to have your own personal project. So there's something that's calling you forth. It's something that wants to come through you and you want to do it in your own community. So you will also have an opportunity to cultivate and create that um, class, that experience in, the, in that class. So that is the Artemis Circle. And you can see it all on my website. It's all there. So um, any questions that people have? I'm seeing Chelsea moving towards her computer. I don't know if that's a question coming towards. No, okay. Any questions? I just wanted to um, just say I'm so, so happy that I took the space to um, be here today. You are just so wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for bringing everything that you brought today. Thank you. Laura? And Wendy? Yeah, so from a, wait, did I unmute? Yeah, from a practical perspective, why my, my mm. video is off is just chasing after yes. a baby who's running around and feeding. Yeah. Um, just in terms of participation and, and like I'm with her and then I work like at mm. four to seven. Um, are they live, are they recorded? Would it be okay if I had her with me? Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, all the classes are live. I always say, like participate live, it's so much more fun. It's just it's just easier and more fun and more engaging. And then you get to have that live interaction. Um, all the classes are recorded. So if you can't make a live class or if you miss a section, you have to go. Um, you can always watch them and you have permanent access to all the recordings. So that's just yours. And then can she come? Absolutely. Like I, we've got a lot of moms that have little ones that come in and visit. What I say is, is that when we're in video space, I ask for it and you actually did it, which I really appreciate is that if there's a lot of motion, if there's a lot of movement, I ask people to turn off the videos so that we can all focus. But if she's just there and you guys are there, then yeah, she's, that all works. Okay, thank you. And I'm putting mute because she's making noise. And then um, if you, if we want, let's say we sign up for Mythos and Sanctuary, but we wanted to continue, there's that choice to do that as well. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Wendy. I just want to make sure I understand that each of these um, offerings are 
uh, separated out from, they're all included in a whole, correct? They're kind of like Russian dolls. So we can take out the one or we could take the whole with all of the other ones inside. Okay, just wanted to make sure I understood that. Yep, yep. In the past, this is, this is completely different. I've never done it like this before. In the past, I had one nine month program. We had all of our guest speakers. You had to sign up for the whole thing. You couldn't get access to anything unless you were in all of it. This is, this is a different time. You know, it's like, it's, it's just different. So I um, made shorter segments so that people could have a much more intensive focused experience. Um, and then our guest speakers, sometimes you might see a series and you're like, I, I just want the guest speakers, but I'm not necessarily have the capacity or interest in the class. Sometimes you can just actually get the speaker series. Um, not all the speaker series are announced yet, but I'll tell you this year's speakers are going to be very epic. I'm so crazy excited about them. Um, and they come with your tuition for the classes. So if you don't get the class, but you're like, oh, I want the speakers, you can, you'll, you'll start seeing it if you're looking at my newsletters, you can just do that. <laughs> and um, for those of you who I don't know and aren't familiar with yet, maybe again sometime soon. Nice to see your face, Carly. Okay, have a lovely day. And um, go work with your love medicine stories and tell us how they go. You can always come to uh, the Story Sanctuary and if you feel inclined to share them there. That's on Facebook and it's a, it's a friendly place where people are warm and, and considerate to the realm of story. So a good place to share. Okay, take good care.